It's a pleasure and an honor to be here to tell you about one of my favorite topics, which is communication avoiding algorithms. And when we began this work, it was specifically for linear algebra. But just in the last year or so, we've generalized it quite dramatically, we believe, to many different kinds of algorithms. So at the risk of some repetition, let me just repeat three motivation slides that you already heard from David. Why do we want to avoid communication? And so our model of cost for an algorithm is going to be, in the, and, and when I say cost, that's both, energy, that's both time and energy. I'm going to count the flops, the usual thing. And I'm also going to count communication. And by that, I mean moving data, either between levels of a memory hierarchy or between processors over a network. And of course, a real machine does both. And so I'm, what, what I'm going to do to convince you that various algorithms are optimal is I'll count the flops, count the number of words moved, and I'm going to count the number of messages they send. Because the way real computers work is you pack a whole bunch of words into a single message and you send that. And that has a separate cost associated with it. There's the time per flop. That's, that's a hardware parameter. There's an, the number of words moved is divided by the bandwidth, you know, the seconds per word. And then that cost of packing up the word, all those words into a single message and shipping it over the network, that has a separate latency cost. And those last two terms are the communication. And it turns out that on modern machines, as we've heard, the time per flop is orders of magnitude less than the time per word, the reciprocal bandwidth. And that, in turn, is orders of magnitude less than the latency. So the worst case latency, imagine you, know, you have to spin the disk around, move the disk head until it gets on top of the location. And then the disk starts spinning, and you start shipping data. That's, those are two separate costs, the latency to get the disk head in the right place and the latency to actually move the data. And that sort of physical phenomenon repeats itself everywhere in the hardware. And so, even, and so here is in some old data about how fast all these different uh, hardware parameters are, are improving. And they're all improving. That's the good news. The bad news is that they're growing apart exponentially. So this, back in the heyday of Moore's Law, your time per flop was improving at 60% a year. The bandwidth was improving at, say, 26%, and the latency only at 15%. In fact, the network latency for sending messages hasn't improved really very much for a long time. Cray won a long time ago was still the winner. And so even if your network is not um, a, uh, even if your algorithm is not communication bound today, it may be next year or year after that. And so we want to avoid communication to save time. But as uh, we already heard from David, that's not the only reason. So here's a plot of the energy it takes to perform a bunch of basic operations on the machine. The vertical axis is a log scale in picojoules. There's a single double precision floating point operation. The next three bars are the energy for moving it on a chip, so register one millimeter, five millimeter. And the last three bars are moving it off chip. That's the really expensive stuff. And the blue bar is today's technology, 45 nanometers. And so you can see it's one and a half orders of magnitude more energy per uh, word moved off chip than, on, than to do a double precision floating point operation. And the prediction is that in five years, everything's going to get better, but it's growing apart again. So it's going to be two and a half orders of magnitude more energy per word moved off chip than to do a double precision floating point operation. So whether you're worried about the battery in your laptop dying or the million dollars per megawatt per year to run your supercomputer center that we've heard about, you want to minimize communication to save energy. OK, so enough of repeating the motivation. So let's go on to the goals. So what I want to do is redesign algorithms to avoid communication between all levels of the memory hierarchy. So between L1 and L2, L2 and DRAM, going over the network, whatever you want. I want to prove lower bounds and attain them if possible. And it, what we're going to see is that current algorithms are often very far from the lower bounds. And so they're very large speed ups and energy savings possible. Now, you don't have to take my word for it that this is a good idea, or David word, David's word. We can take the word of somebody at a higher pay scale, so President Obama. And so here's a, qu <laughs> and so here's a quote from the Department of Energy budget request to Congress from FY012. And I'm just, it's very long, but it says, on modern computer architectures, communication takes longer than floating point. And it refers to some new methods to minimize communication between processors in the memory hierarchy by reformulating the algorithms. And it's saying this has been introduced into the Trilinos framework, which is one of the you know, libraries that you, I'm sure you've heard about. And so when we heard about that, we talked to Mike Rue and said, what were they talking about? And it's actually our algorithms, because my, so we, uh, our algorithms through um, Mark Homan, who is my graduate student, and then uh, Mike's postdoc has been you know, introducing these into Trilinos. And these are some of the algorithms that I'll mention later, later in the talk. 
Okay, so here's the outline. I'm gonna survey the state of the art in, I'll use CA, not for California, but for communication avoiding as, as the abbreviation here. And I'll, review, I'll begin by reviewing some really basic stuff about matrix multiply, since that's the starting point for just about everything, and remind you what the naive algorithm is and how to make it optimal. And then I will go on and say that algorithm we thought was optimal for many, many years since 1983 actually isn't. There's something you can do asymptotically faster if you just change your definition of optimality, give yourself a little bit more freedom. And those are called two and a half dimensional matrix multiply algorithms. And I'll also uh, outline it for LU. I'll tell you a little bit about tall skinny QR because I'll need that later for the iterative solvers. And then because we all know that you can, don't need to do n cube floating point operations to do linear algebra, I'll say how it all extends to Strassen-like algorithms. So as I mentioned, it turns out that all these ideas go well beyond linear algebra. And so basically you can extend them, these lower bounds to any algorithm that accesses arrays. All you care, you can have any number of array indices that you want, any number of loops. And this, all I care about is the subscripts have to be sort of linear functions, the loop indices. And we can write down optimal algorithms, and I'll give you an example of the n-body problem. And then, in the third hour of my talk, I'll go on and talk about Krilov subspace methods. Okay, so let's go on to the uh, communication avoiding algorithms. And so here's the summary. So I'm gonna begin with direct linear algebra. And so what, I, what we've done is we've proven lower bounds on communication for basically anything that smells like the usual three nested loops. So I will have a careful mathematical definition of smells like the usual three nested loops later, but right now your intuition about what you know, matrix multiply looks like is perfectly good. So it includes Gauss elimination, all the different flavors, least squares problems, eigenvalue problems, the SVD. So given those lower bounds, the natural thing to do is to go to the standard libraries that people like Jack Dungara and I are responsible for, LAPAC and ScalaPAC, and ask, do they attain the lower bounds? And they don't. They're asymptotically more expensive than necessary. And so what we've been doing for the last few years is systematically redesigning new algorithms that do attain those lower bounds and, add, and putting them into those libraries for which we have some support from NSF and DOE to redo LAPAC and ScalaPAC and Plasma and Magma. And so you'll see that there's large speedups possible. Now, what our theory does is it uh, tells you what the design space is. It doesn't tell you all the constants, you know, to actually you know, what are the right block sizes. So, in fact, there's a lot of auto-tuning that has to go on in order to get all the constants right. So, but I'm not going to go into that particular detail in this talk. And then, so that's the summary of direct linear algebra. And let me just say ditto for iterative linear algebra. It's sort of the same story. So let me go on now to say what the lower bounds are. And so, um, and as I said, this is for anything that smells like the usual three nested loops. And so let me just state it um, uh, in terms of a number m. That's a hardware parameter. It's your local memory. So if I'm moving data between DRAM and cache, m is the cache size. And if I'm moving data between different processors over a network, m is the local memory on your processor, right? That's the cheap stuff to get. And so it turns out that for all these different algorithms, the number of words moved per processor is lower bounded by however many floating point operations that processor does divided by the square root of its local memory size. Right? That's the lower bound. Now, in the parallel case, the flops per processor, well, let's assume it's load balance. Everybody gets to do one piece of the work, say n cubed over p, something like that. So, so this has been, as I said, this has been known for a long time in certain special cases. It was proved in 1981, I think, by Hong and Kung for sequential matrix multiply. And what we were lucky enough to realize in the, in the sequential case is it applies to basically anything. So that smells like three nested loops. So the blahs, LU, QR, eigenvalue problems, SVD, tensor contractions. Of course, tensors are more than three nested loops, but they smell enough like it that it works. It applies to some whole programs, uh, sequences of these operations, no matter how you interleave them. So for example, if you need to compute a power of a matrix, that's multiple matrix multiplies. You can imagine interleaving them in some arbitrary way. It's still the same lower bound. It works on both dense and sparse matrices. The number of flops does not have to be n cubed. Um, it can be whatever the sparse matrix requires. It's still the same lower bound. As I said, it works for sequential and parallel because that's flops per processor. And it works for some graph theoretic algorithms because I don't, you don't have to do multiplies and adds in the inner loop. All you have to do is access those three arrays, you know, a sub ij and so forth. And so the floyd warshall algorithm for finding all pairs shortest path is also covered by this. And there's also a new parallel algorithm, optimal algorithm that comes out of this. And so that's the lower bound that we want to attain for the bandwidth, the number of words moved. But I remember I said there were two costs, number of words moved and latency, the number of messages. So the simplest way to get a lower bound in the number of messages is say, well, let's suppose that I always send the largest possible messages. 
So you know, pack all the words together into the largest message size, that's clearly a lower bound on the number of messages sent. So how big can the largest message be? Your whole memory, your local memory. And so this lower bound is just a factor of m smaller than that lower bound. So that's going to be our goal for all of these algorithms, to hit these two lower bounds. And I'm pleased to say this won a best paper prize in, in 2012. OK, so now let me come back and ask, can we attain these lower bounds? And as I said, when we got them, we went back and looked at LAPAC and Scalapac. And the answer was that they generally don't attain the lower bounds. I'll be more specific later. And then we decided, OK, we better go and reinvent everything. And so what does that mean? So it wasn't, it's not just loop transformations. It's not just doing the same uh, numerical algorithms in a different order. I mean, you have to do that too. But it required new numerical algorithms with new numerical properties, new stability properties, new ways to encode the answer. I'll give examples of all these later. And new data structures. So it required some, some reinvention. Now, so we've been, had the most success in the dense case. Sparse case is much more challenging, as you can imagine. So multiplying two diagonal matrices, right? Two sparse matrices. There's no magic in multiplying diagonal matrices, right? So, so you need some extra structure, something interesting about the sparsity structure. And so one kind of maybe uh, academic example is if, if you assume your matrices are random in the erdish renyi sense of random, then the lower bounds apply, and there's an optimal algorithm. And maybe a little bit more practically, suppose you have a sparse matrix with large separators, so 2D meshes, 3D meshes, those kinds of things. And the lower bounds apply, and there are optimal algorithms for, say, sparse Kolesky on those kind of matrices. But there's lots of work in progress. And I'll just do a little bit of a highlight of that. I should say, we, um, since I'm just doing highlights, we were asked to write a uh, survey article for Act in America. And so that just got published. So there's a 155-page survey that just appeared that, you know, that posted on our web page. You'll get a pointer later where you can sort of see pointers to all the more details. So let's go and review the previous matrix multiply so we can sort of see where this comes from. So I'll start with the simplest possible three nested loops, loop over i, j, and k. And in the middle, you, you, know, you do the accumulation. And I'll illustrate it here with a picture. I want to compute Cij, and it's going to be the dot product, no surprise, of the ith row of A and the jth column of B. So what I want to do now is annotate this code to say where the data movement is, the communication. So let me just add some comments to say where the data movement happens. So I'm going to, the first thing I do is I'm going to read row I of A into fast memory, because I'm going to use it over and over again. So let me just read it into cache and keep it there. Then in the next loop, I'll read in C sub Ij. Then I get that column, and the inner loop does a dot product, but there's no communication in the dot product. And when I'm done, I've completely computed C, and I put it back out into, into memory. So let me add it all up. I've read each row of A exactly once and reused it. That's great. Can't read A less than once. I've read and written C exactly once, n squared. Can't do better than that. The big cost is B. I read B over and over again, because the, inner the two innermost loops are doing a vector times a matrix multiply. And every time I do that, I have to read B over and over again. So I'm doing n cubed reads all together. And those n cubed reads, because the matrix B, totally dominates the n cubed arithmetic. So how do we improve this? Here is the well-known, for a long time, tiled algorithm, which will hit the lower bound. I'm going to think of these, uh, my matrix not of one by one entries, but of blocks. So each of these little squares is a B by B block. B is a tuning parameter we'll fix. And so I'm still going to have three nested loops, but I'm going to loop over all of these blocks. And so what I'm going to do inside my, my loop is I'm going to read in that B by, by B block, read in that B by B block, and then, assuming they all fit into cache, my, I'll have three more inner loops. This line is actually a B by B matrix multiply. And there's no more data movement there. So that's going to be the new algorithm. And the question is, how, much, how do I choose B, and how you know, fast does it go? So my assumption is that I can fit that block, that block, and that block into fast memory. So 3 times B squared has to fit in cache. That's, that's what I'm assuming here. So there's no communication when I do that. And so I can do all the accounting and add up the number of reads and writes. And it turns out that it's a factor of B times smaller than it was before. So it used to be n cubed reads. Now it's n cubed over B. And when b is large, it's going to be much less than the arith arithmetic cost, and so I'm going to go a lot faster. So the question is, how do I pick b, and does this attain the lower bound? And so what's my, I want to make b as big as possible, because b is in the denominator. My assumption was that I had to fit three by, b by b blocks into fast memory at a time. So that means you know, 3b squared is less than or equal to the, the cache size. And so let me pick it as big as possible. 
B is about the square root of M, so I get N cubed divided by the square root of the cache size, and that actually attains the lower bound. And this has been known for a long time. Um, so from a software point of view, this, this sounds great, but what if you don't know M, right? Uh, you know, if I want to write portable code, what am I going to do? Everybody's M is different. And of course, there's not just one level of cache with one M, there's multiple levels of cache. That means I have to do this, you know, if I have three levels of cache, I don't need, you know, three nested loops or six nested loops. I may need nine or 12 nested loops. It's a pain. It turns out there's a way to deal with it. It's called a cache oblivious algorithm, and it's just done uh, recursively. So it turns out recursion, recursion can hide all those details, but I won't go into that right now. So, so that's been known for a while. And, and again, this is just review of what was thought to be optimal for a long time. And so now let me remind you of what's thought to be optimal for parallel matrix multiply. This is called a summa algorithm, also been around for a very long time. It's n by n matrix multiply on, a, on p processors. So in this picture, I have 16 processors laid out in a four by four grid. And I kind of do the obvious thing. Each processor gets 1 16th of the matrix. So that processor owns that subblock of A. And what is the algorithm going to do? What it needs to do, what, what does matrix multiply do? It needs to take each block column of A, do an outer product with each block row of B, and then add it to C. So how do I orchestrate all that communication? What this processor who owns that block of red block of A is going to do is he's going to broadcast it to his uh, left or right. And so everybody in that row will get a redundant copy of that block of A. This processor will take that blue block of B and broadcast it down, so everybody owes a, owns a redundant copy. This processor is going to get the blue copy from his neighbor above, the red copy from his neighbor to the left, and do a local update of C. And that's where all the floating point does, uh, work does. And then I'll just loop over all these blocks, the red guy going from left to right, the blue guy going from top to bottom, and do all those local updates. That is the classical parallel matrix multiply algorithm. This is in all the usual libraries, been there for a long time. And I won't try to you know, explain all the code, but this hits what I claimed was the lower bound. So let me just remind you what that lower bound is again. So let me just summarize all of the dense parallel algorithms attaining the communication lower bound. So let me assume that just as for that picture of, of parallel matrix multiply of n by n, n by n matrices, I'm putting them on P processors. I'm going to do load, make it load balanced so everybody does one piece of the work. And I'm going to make this apparently reasonable assumption that I'm going to use as little memory as possible. So I'm going to use just as enough memory so that everybody owns one piece of the data. So there's n squared data, everybody owns a piece of it, because I need that for my lower bounds. M goes in the denominator. So what are the lower bounds? The number of words moved is the num work per processor, n cubed over p, divided by the square root of the memory, plug that in, and I get n squared over the square root of p. And that's attained by summa. And how about the number of messages? That was the work per processor divided by the local memory to the three halves, plug it in, and you get the square root of p. And again, that is attained by summa. So when we got these lower bounds, we said, OK, matrix multiply. That's good, attains it. What about all the other algorithms in scale, scale pack? Actually, for the number of words moved, most of the algorithms in scale pack did attain the lower bound, except for the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem. That's, that's much more difficult. But basically, almost none of them hit the lower bound of the number of messages. They were almost all asymptotically worse. You know, orders of magnitude more messages than necessary, except for Kolesky. Okay? And so what, what we did then is we went off and designed new algorithms, as I mentioned, that hit these lower bounds for just about everything. Uh, the the non-symmetric eigenproblem is still a challenge. The only algorithm we know that hits these lower bounds in theory is a randomized algorithm. We don't know how to do it in a uh, non-randomized way. So I would say this is still you know, work in progress. So, so that made us very happy that we hit the lower bound, assuming the minimum memory per processor. But then we asked, can we do better? And that seems like a silly question, because I just told you they were optimal. But there was an assumption in my optimality that you know, I assumed I was using the least amount of memory possible. So that's not necessary. The lower bound uh, has m in the denominator, and it's still true when m is larger than the least amount of memory, than the, than the minimum necessary. So the point is, if you use more memory, and you bought it, I mean, you, you, you paid for this memory when you have the processor, you alloc get an allocation, you might as well use it all and go faster. So the question is, can we attain it? And again, there was one classical, well-known special case called 3D matrix multiply that was invented a long time ago. And it used exactly p to the 1 third times as much memory as the, as the, as the minimum necessary. And, and uh, there, you know, that's a kind of a strange case. You usually don't have that much memory, extra memory available. You might only have you know, 
room for twice the memory or three times the memory or whatever, not p to the one third times as much memory. So that takes us to the next part of the talk, which is uh, communication avoiding two and a half dimensional algorithms, which use whatever memory you have available to hit the lower bound. And so let me just show you the matrix multiply again. So I'm going to assume that I have enough memory for C copies the data. So C is you know, a small parameter, you know, small integer. You know, so I can have two C equals two copies or four copies, whatever. So here's how I'm going to lay out the data. Here's the algorithm. I'm going to take my P processors and lay them out in this two and a half dimensional grid. That's why we're calling it a two and a half dimensional algorithm. So they're going to be C layers. And each layer is going to have a redundant copy of the data. I'll show you in a minute. And then each layer has a square layout of one C of the processors. Okay? So here's what the layout would be, for example, if I had enough memory for two copies and 32 processors. And so to write down the algorithm at a very high level, let me just index all of the uh, processors by i, j, and k in that simple way. And I'm going to assume that initially I have one copy of the data. So A is laid out on the top grid. You know, each processor is going to get, you know, a a 1 16th, and the matrix B is laid out on the top grid. And so now, what is the algorithm going to do? It's basically going to do this. It's going to every processor that owns a little block of A and B is going to broadcast it down. So I get C copies. Every layer is going to get a redundant copy of, of A and B. Then each layer is going to independently run 1 seeth of the sum algorithm that I just told you about. So it's going to compute 1 seeth of all the partial sums that, that you would need to normally compute. And when it's done, all of the partial sums are going to be stacked right on top of one another. All the partial sums for that block of C are going to be on top of one another. And then you do a reduc vertical reductions at the end. Every you know, pair is, of these uh, processors is going to do a reduction and compute the sum, and it's going to appear on the top. And that turns out to hit the lower bound. So the question is, is this worth doing? Uh, how, how much speed up do we get? How about a factor of 12? So 12 times faster matrix multiply. So here's some uh, experiments. So this is on a uh, 16,000 processor BGP with 64,000 cores. Two experiments, one a very small matrix where you wouldn't think it's worth using all that many cores on, and then a, a larger matrix. And uh, the vertical axis is percent of machine peak, so 100% is the best you can do. And if you just run, and, and the blue bar is classical, optimal, summa, minimal memory, and the green bar is the new algorithm. And so you see you're getting like 5% of peak to multiply this tiny matrix in these, all these processors, so most people wouldn't bother. But you can get up to like more like 25% of peak uh, if you use this re uh, redundant algorithm, which happens to use 16 copies. On this much larger matrix, it's only a factor of 2.7 speed up. And that's because uh, you know, it's much more compute bound. And so you know, getting rid of the communication didn't help quite as much. It's only a factor of 2.7. But let me show you the timing breakdown to see where these speed ups actually come from. So what I'm going to do is, for these two experiments, I'm going to show you where the time went. You know, communication, computation, idle. So here are the two experiments. And it's normalized so that this is the, uh, the time spent by the two-dimensional algorithm. No redundancy is 1. And it's color coded by where the time went. So the red is communication. The blue is idle. And the green is computation. And you can see that we got rid of 95% of the communication by using this two and a half dimensional algorithm. Same thing over here, uh, but even the flops went faster. So why did the flops go faster? Because we're doing the same flops. It's because we're doing larger DGEMs locally. And so since they're larger, they went faster. And uh, here, it, you know, the DGEMs went about the same speed. And so, it, so the, but the other way to look at this is to say that, you know, if this is where all your energy went in communication, maybe I just save you 95% of the energy. So it may be worth doing it even if it only goes 2.7 times faster. So I'm pleased to say this won another paper prize. So, so now um, let me tell you what this algorithm achieves in a, in a, in a, from a different point of view. It gives you, it has a property of perfect strong scaling in both time and energy. So here's the idea. Every time you add a processor, you, know, you, get, you, you want to scale, you want to use more processors, it comes with memory. You've paid for it. Why don't you use it? Okay. So what I'm going to do is do strong scaling where I use all the available memory when I get a new processor. So I'm going to write down sort of the, the formulas that tell me how I scale. So I'm going to assume that I start with the minimum amount of memory. So P times memory per processor just barely fits my three n by n matrices. I'm going to say, what happens if I increase the number of processors by a factor of C and I use all the memory, which is also increased by a factor of C. So I just want to write down the formula. So here's the notation. I'm going to count the seconds per flop, 
the seconds per word moved, and the seconds per message sent of size uh, little m. You can pick it whatever you want, doesn't matter. And now I put it all together, I count the number of flops, multiply it by gamma, count the words moved, multiply it by beta, and I get this kind of messy formula. The time as a function of the number of processors is this formula. Now, the only thing I care about is how it scales. It scales perfectly. If I increase the number of processors by a factor of c, the flop time goes down by a factor of c, the bandwidth time goes down by a factor of c, and the latency time goes down by a factor of c. It all scales perfectly. So that's perfect strong scaling in time. So what do I mean by energy now? I need another formula. So my model is I'm going to count the joules per flop, the joules per word moved, the joules per message sent over the network. And we work actually with you know, hardware designers to make sure these models make sense. So this, from their point of view, is a pretty decent model. But th that's not the only place energy gets, gets spent, because the memory is also burning energy. So I'm going to count the joules per word of memory used per second, because that's burning. And then there's all that leakage stuff in the fans and you know, who knows what else. But th there's another big chunk that's just proportional to time. So again, I can write down a big, messy formula. Uh, for all of the energy spent. And the question is, I want to know how it scales. And it scales perfectly. It's independent of how many processors. So I can multiply the matri these two matrices c times faster with the same amount of energy that I would to uh, have spent to multiply them more slowly. So that's perfect strong scaling in energy. So how can this be? The idea is that each processor is burning the same power for one c as long. And there are c times as many of them, so it all cancels. Right, so the point is the power is constant. And so this uh, formula I just did for matrix multiply, classical, but it extends to a lot of other algorithms, n-body codes, Strassen's algorithm, and all sorts of things. And uh, the other thing that we uh, just actually finished last week, so I don't really have a slide on it, is we can also tell you what your network has to look like in order to attain these lower bounds. Because <clears throat> um, uh, when I told you about Summa's algorithm, I said, you know, you broadcast left, broadcast right, up and down. That kind of fit automatically, naturally, on a two-dimensional torus network. It turns out you can prove that our algorithm does not, our 2.5D algorithm does not work on a 2D torus. You need at least a 3D torus. And the good news is, of course, blue gene and most modern machines have at least a 3D torus. So we can also give you lower bounds on what your hardware topologies look like for different algorithms. Turns out uh, Strassen is, is uh, harder. You need at least a 4D torus. So, and that's, uh, so that's, but that's another long paper. So let me just give you one more shot of what happens to Gaussian elimination. And so here's an experiment again. And, I'm, and the thing is, in order to do pivoting, it turns out you can prove that partial pivoting, the thing we all teach you know, the, for a long time, cannot attain the lower bound. You need a new kind of pivoting. And we uh, invented one. It's called tournament pivoting. I don't have time to go into it. Uh, and we had to prove it was numerically stable. And so we did all that. And so this is what communication avoiding pivoting is referring to. And so you can see that. And here I'm, so here is a communication avoiding pivoting where, with no um, 2.5D algorithms using the minimum memory. And here's how much faster you can go if you use redundant memory. And so you can see, again, the communication time dropped dramatically. Um, and in here it did too, but again, the overall speed up is smaller because communication was only one third of the time. But it you know, could have been a much larger fraction of the energy. So you know, when, we, when we invented this algorithm, the, the, uh, two, the communication avoiding pivoting in two and a half dimensional LU, we realized it could hit this new bandwidth lower bound. You know, the bandwidth decreased as we expected, but the latency went up. So we couldn't make them both smaller at the same time. And so we struggled, and of course, you know, what you'd rather have when you can't attain the lower bound that you want is a new lower bound. So we proved a new, higher lower bound. And I was just proofreading it on the plane. I'm pretty sure it's right. Um, so there's a new theorem that says that perfect strong scaling is impossible in the following sense. The new lower bound says that for algorithms like LU or QR, where you have a dependency kind of going down the diagonal, you know, you, you know things have to happen in an order. Then there's, a, there's an extra lower bound that says the latency cost times the bandwidth cost is lower bounded by n squared. So if I make the bandwidth smaller, the latency's got to go up, you know, because they, they trade off with one another. So if the latency is your killer, then c equals one copy of the data is optimal, no redundancy. If bandwidth is the bottleneck, then it's worth having multiple copies. And, and on this platform, it was. So, that's, so this is uh, where things stand. So that's all I wanted to say about 2.5D MATML and LU. And now I'm going to go on to a, a different looking algorithm, which is uh, tall, skinny QR, which I'll need later. <laughs>
So what I want to do is I have a tall, skinny matrix, and I want to do its QR decomposition. And um, so let me uh, give you an illustration of its on four processors. So here, W has many more rows than columns. And I've assigned the first n over four rows to processor 0, the next n over four process rows to processor 1, and so forth. And so I want to do the QR decomposition. So here's how it's going to work. Um, the first thing I do is that without any communication at all, every processor does a local QR decomposition of the data it owns. And so uh, that does not look like the usual QR decomposition. But let me just write it in a slightly different way. What I've really done implicitly is I've factored my column of matrices into the product of this block diagonal orthogonal matrix and this stack of four triangles. Right? I don't want four triangles, or I want one triangle, but it's progress. So the next thing I do is I take each pair of those triangles, put them together, and do a local QR decomposition just of that pair and of that pair. And so I get QR of that and QR of that. And again, what I've implicitly done is factored this stack of four triangles into this block diagonal orthogonal matrix times half as many triangles as I had before. Then I take those two triangles, do QR again. And now what I've done is I've implicitly factored my original matrix, W, into the product of that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times that orthogonal matrix times R. That's the QR decomposition just written with a different data structure. And so the data structure is all those different factors that come out. Okay? And as we'll see, this can give you enormous speed ups over the usual algorithm. But it's a different data structure. You know, it's all perfectly numerically stable and all of that. So let me now sort of abbreviate what this algorithm did in a little picture. All I've basically done is called MPI reduce, where my reduction operator is a QR decomposition. All I do is I take a pair of matrices, do QR, and pass up the R factor up in this little binary tree. That's all I did. And out at the end pops R, and I have to save the Qs along the way. So that is the parallel algorithm. So, but what about you know, all the other memory hierarchies I want to deal with? What if I want to have a you know, minimized communication on a sequential machine, which means between the DRAM and the cache? I'm going to use exactly the same algorithm. I'm just going to use a different reduction tree. So here is the optimal algorithm for doing tall, skinny QR on a matrix that doesn't fit in cache. And it's going to read the matrix from DRAM to cache once. One is a lower bound. Okay, so. The way it's going to work, it'll read in the first, let's say, n over 4 rows. That's all that fits in cache. Do QR. Read in the next n over 4 rows. Stack R0 on top of W1. Do QR. Read in the next quarter of the rows. Put, you know, stack that triangle on top. Do QR. And by the time it's done, you have the, QR, the same QR decomposition, but it's a different data structure and a different layout. But I've only read it once. Now, what if I have like a dual core machine and I have parallelism and I have, you know, I want to minimize the traffic from, from memory? Well, you might have a tree that looks like this. But, you know, what if I have a real computer? You know, it's multi core and multi socket and multi rack and multi site and, you know, you name it. What I'm going to do is choose a re reduction tree dynamically. Whatever hardware resources I have, I will simply use those in order to pick the optimal reduction tree. And I will get a different format of QR, but anything you could do with with the old QR, you can do with this one. So what benefits do I get? Here are some of the performance speedups. 8x on an Intel Cloverton on an 8-core machine. So that's about as good as you're going to get. On a 6.7x on a Pentium 3 cluster over Dolphin Interconnects. 4x speed up on a few processors on, on a, a Blue Gene. 13x on a, on a Tesla on, on a GPU. Uh, this was an experiment where there was a matrix spread over four cities on uh, the uh, internet in, in, in France. And so the question was, how much faster can you do the QR decomposition on four very uh, far apart machines where the latency is enormous? You, know, you can imagine sending data over the internet. It was four times faster. Um, now, here's another experiment uh, on cloud computing. And in this case, what's your metric? Your metric is how long does it take to just grab the data once out of the cloud and, and, and do anything with it? And, and so it turned out that these folks could do this, and this was using a Hadoop and a, some Python code and so forth. They were only 1.6 times slower than accessing the data twice, right? Accessing the data once is a lower bound. And so that's how much slower they were just to do the QR in that case. In the sequential case, we once got an infinite speed up. Uh, what does that mean? That meant that the data was too big to fit in my student's uh, uh, laptop in his DRAM. So he, the classical algorithm for doing QR was thrashing the disk. And it finally, he just gave up waiting for it to stop. And the new algorithm only went two times as slow as though he had infinite DRAM. So it almost completely hid the cost of the, of the disk latency. 
Um, I should say that L the SVD of a tall skinny matrix, it's, it's the same algorithm. It, it, all these improvements would you know, uh, translate over to the singular value decomposition. And, so, and there's lots of other things that we're uh, continuing to do with this. So let me sort of summarize the ongoing work in dense linear algebra. So, um, uh, so not just, you know, so we're trying to improve the blahs. Uh, this one, a best paper awarded IPDPS, doing it for the symmetric indefinite factorization. Uh, incorporating pivoting is, is a challenge. You can't pivot in the usual way and hit the lower bounds, not just for Gauss elimination. If you want to do QR with column pivoting, you got to have a different pivoting scheme. There's all sorts of new eigenvalue algorithms we needed, all pair of shortest path I mentioned. Um, we're targeting all sorts of different uh, platforms. And uh, we have money. Uh, Jack Dongera and Julian Langu and I have a grant from the National Science Foundation to update LAPAC and Scalapack and all these other packages. So hopefully it will all appear in all of your tools automatically. And we're trying to integrate it into certain applications. Uh, for example, with the, uh, 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 the uh, Cyclops tensor uh, contraction engine is going into, you know, into this uh, quantum chemistry code. So, so that's all about order n cubed stuff. Let me just have two slides to say Strassen, because we know that you don't have to do n cube flops to multiply matrices or, or the rest of linear algebra. You can do it in n to some smaller exponent. And so let me just tell you the story here very briefly. So I'll, let me just, for contrast, rem remind you of the lower bound that I've already told you for classical matrix multiply. So this is just another way to write the number of flops, n cubed over p, divided by m to the 1 half. I've written it in this funny way just to make the typesetting easy, OK? So there's a 3 there and a 3 there. For Strassen, all you have to do is change the 3 to a log base 2 of 7. And so you do, the proof is much harder than the typesetting. But the, the idea is you change, you're, you're not doing n cubed flops anymore. You're doing n to log base 2 of 7. And the number of words move, that n cube, that cube has also changed to a log base 2 of 7. And what about all the other? algorithms that people have invented since Strassen, because you know, that started a long line of work. And it turns out that for Strassen-like algorithms, you just change that exponent into whatever that exponent is supposed to be, which currently has a you know, lower bound of 2.356, something or other. Uh, people keep working on it. So, so what do I mean by Strassen-like? There, there's a certain assumption on the DAG. It must be connected. It can't be uh, disconnected. So there, it doesn't apply to absolutely everything. And it uses some interesting uh, proof techniques from graph expansion theory. And it works up to a certain point, and uh, it turns out when you hit this uh, amount of memory by doing uh, so the, uh, the 2.5D version of it, then it stops. There's sort of a maximum amount of memory that you can possibly use, and you can't go any faster. And I'm pleased to say this won another best paper prize. So the next question is, can we attain this lower bound? Again, you know, this is theory, and so the question is, can we attain it? So let me show you some performance data. And so this is strong scaling data for a 94,000 by 94,000 matrix on Franklin, so uh, an old machine at NERSC, going all the way from 49 processors, which of course is coincidentally 7 squared, convenient for Strassen, all the way up to thousands of processors. The vertical axis is the effective gigaflops per node. So that means pr uh, pretend you were doing n the n cubed algorithm and running at peak speed, you know, no communication, how fast would you run? And this is the peak speed of the machine. Okay, so this is this means the vertical axis is is comparing time. So it's fair to compare Strauss and everybody else. So the vertical axis is just proportional to to, to you know, inverse time. And so the green the two green lines are the classical algorithms. There's the summa algorithm in scale pack. There's the 2.5D algorithm I told you about. Still doing n cube but minimizing communication. It's faster. It gets pretty close to machine peak. These blue lines are previous attempts in the literature to parallelize Strauss and didn't work so well. And then here's our new one, and here you can see it's pretty darn flat. Uh, it, so it's, it has, it's attaining nearly perfect strong scaling as we increase the number of processors and use all the available memory, and eventually it tails off. And it's going faster than you know, machine peak. So, and I'm pleased to say this was, uh, appeared as a research highlight in the CACM. OK, so that's all I want to say about direct linear algebra. And now I want to go on to beyond linear algebra, how all these ideas extend to basically arbitrary code with nested loops that access arrays. That's the only structure that we need. And so let me, again, start with matrix multiply to tell you how I'm going to generalize. So there are my three nested loops, you know, i, j, k, matrix multiply. There's the block code that I showed you before. I'm going to, my inner loop, my th inner loop is going to just do b by b matrix multiply. My outer loop is going to iterate over those blocks. 
And the theorem that I told you about before said that if I pick the block size to be the square root of m, then the number of words moved is n cubed divided by m to the square to the m to the one half. So the question is, where do all these one halves come from? So let me just illustrate the new ideas by applying our theorem to matrix multiply, but rather than stating the theorem in its total generality. So my input is simply saying, I have three nested loops, and there's my arrays. Everything I need to know about that code, I embed in this three by three matrix. It says which arrays have which indices. So there's one row for each array, A, B, C, one column for each index, and there's a one to say that A has I as a subscript, has K as a subscript, but not J. So everything I need to know is in that little three by three matrix. The theory goes on to say, what you need to do is solve a, lin a three by three linear program for this, for this vector of three scalars, and what's the linear program? Maximize the sum of these three scalars subject to the constraints that delta times x is less than or equal to one. And when you solve this trivial little linear program, out pops one half, one half, one half, and the value, the optimal value of the linear program is three halves. And I'm gonna give that a name, S sub HBL. HBL are the acronyms of three famous mathematicians whose names you'll see on a, on a slide in a couple slides. So, so having done all that, what does the theory say? That no matter how you reorganize this algorithm, the number of words moved is lower bounded by the number of flops divided by m to the magic exponent s sub HBL minus one. That's where that one half comes from. And the optimal blocking sizes are given to you by the solutions of the linear program, m to the one half, m to the one half, m to the one half, for the i index, for the j index, for the k index. So, uh, so that's what the theory tells us for matrix multiply. But this, this is very simple, so let me apply it to another algorithm. Let me apply it to the direct n body algorithm. So it's an even simpler linear program. So now I only have two nested loops. I loop over all pairs of particles and I update the force, compute some function. So all I need to know is I record which arrays, f, p sub i, and p sub j, have which subscripts, i and j, p's indexed twice, so that's okay. I solve the same little linear program, and out pops the solution to the linear program is two. And the, the optimal x's that attain that are one and one. So the theorem says that if I wanna do the direct end body code, the number of words moved is n squared to the power m, so that's even better than uh, matrix multiply, and it's attained by block sizes m by m. And in fact, it says that a 0.5D algorithm should work for this. So let's just try it. So here are some speed ups running that algorithm predicted by this theory. And this is for 32,000 particles on 8,000 cores of an IBM BGP. This seems silly, right? This is four particles per core. It seems like it's gonna be totally overwhelmed by communication. And the answer is we can make the communication go away completely. So if I just run it on one processor, um, uh, if, if, I, if I just r use one copy of the data, you know, so no redundancy, I'm, I'm spend all my time communicating and the green bar tells me, yes, I'm doing all my time shifting the particles from one processor to another and very little time doing computation. But by the time I'm willing to have 64 copies, so that means, you know, four times 64 particles per processor, it's still tiny, the communication's gone away and I have perfect strong scaling. I'm getting a speed up of almost 12 on this platform, okay? So that's an example for n-body. But as I said, this is very general. So let me just write down some random code and apply the theory and see what it tells us. So I'm just gonna write down three random lines of code. I mean, this is not science, it's just random code. So six nested loops, you know, six arrays, I just put in random subscripts, and I wanna know how do I optimize this? So all I need to do is record in this six by six matrix, you know, which arrays have which subscripts, and solve a linear program. What does it tell me? It tells me the solution to that linear program is this bunch of numbers, and their sum is 15 sevenths. And so the theory says that no matter how I reorganize this weird looking code, the number of words moved is gonna be bounded below by the number of loop iterations, n to the six divided by m to the eight sevenths. You know, that's what it is, right? So, and it, that's, that's what comes out of any kind of code that you wanna analyze. And it, and it tells you what the optimal algorithm is. It's m to the two sevenths, m to the three sevenths, m to the one seventh, that attains the lower bound. So, so now that I've given you these illustrations, what does the general theory look like? How general is this stuff? So there's matrix multiply again. And as I said, all you have to do is think about it is that I'm iterating over some subset of triples of integers, Z3 or triples of integers, and I'm accessing locations that are indexed by these you know, pairs of integers, pairs of subscripts, IJ, IK, KJ. Now what's the general case? I could have arbitrary loop indices, you know, and they don't have to be square. You know, I could have some sparse iteration space, and I can have as many arrays as I like, 
in as many lines of code. All I care about is that these subscripts are linear functions of the loop indices. And I'm allowed to have pointers. Pointers are OK, too. And so uh, here's what the general theory looks like. I'm looping over some subset of k tuples of integers. So I think of you know, sort of like having k nested loops. And I'm going to access locations which are indexed by group homomorphisms applied to these d tuples of integers. So now, for a couple of slides, there's going to be some mathematical notation which is required to sort of just state it. But you know, the basic idea, you don't, you don't need to know all the group theory and functional analysis that's required to prove these lower bounds. And so I'm going to use this. And the goal is I'm going to have communication lower bounds and optimal algorithms for any program to look like this. You can have any kinds of you know, weird code that looks like this. So the, the question we have to answer, ask and answer is, given some subset of the loop iterations, you know, whatever fits in cache, how much, how much data do we need? Right? So I want to do, let's say, m to the 3 have iterations of matrix multiply. How, much, how many matrix entries do I need? That's sort of what you need to do the lower bounds. And so in mathematical language, that's saying, given some subset s of k tuples of integers, that's my iteration space, and these projections onto the arrays, I need to bound the size of the number of loop iterations, how many loop iterations can it iterate in terms of the number of entries of matrix 1, matrix 2, up to matrix M. So I need to sort of bound that guy in terms of that guy. And now, finally, we find out who HBL are. Their names are Holder, Brasskamp, and Leap. So if you ever studied Holder's inequality in a functional analysis class, you know, he generalized Cauchy-Schwartz, and these people generalized it later. And what they needed to do, it turns out, or, well, people eventually need to do is write down a linear program, an LP. And the LP is some linear constraints in these M numbers. And the, and the linear constraints say that for all subgroups, these are additive subgroups under addition of k tuples of integers, the rank, that's like the dimension of a, of a vector space, the rank of a, a group, has to be bounded below by this particular linear combination of these ranks. Now, I don't want you to explain. I don't need you to understand that in much detail. But the point is, just a few years ago, a team of pure mathematicians, including Mike Christ, who's my collaborator in this at Berkeley, Terry Tao at UCLA, and a bunch of people in England, proved that you can indeed bound the number of loop iterations. I mean, they were pure mathematicians. They had no idea. You know, they weren't thinking computer science. So, <laughs> so, but you can bound the number of loop iterations in terms of how many array indices you have by this product. You need to have these exponents. And, 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 so, uh, and so I was lucky enough to realize that this solved a computer science problem. And so our theorem says that given a program with array references given by these uh, group homomorphisms projections, what I'm going to do is choose these exponents to minimize their sum subject to these linear constraints. And then the number of words moved is going to be bounded below by the number of loop iterations divided by m to the magical exponent, the solution of the linear program minus 1. And so the question is, is it attainable? So that's the next step. But the first question is, can we write it down? Because let me just go back. This was for all subgroups of ZK, this inequality should hold. There's an infinite number of subgroups, right? This looks, does not look like a linear program. It looks like some really hard thing, because there's an infinite number of inequalities. In fact, there's only a finite number, because all of these coefficients are integers in some bounded array. So it actually is a linear program. But the question is, can we write it down? The bad news is that it reduces to Hilbert's 10th problem over the rationals. So um, we all probably know what Hilbert's 10th problem is over the integers. You know, given an arbitrary set of polynomial equations over the integers, does it have a solution or not? That was proven undecidable in the 60s. And the rationals are a little bit different, uh, and nobody knows. It's conjectured to be undecidable. So that held us back for a while. But then the good news is we, we realized you could write down another linear program with the same solution. And it is decidable. So it's all decidable. And so now the question is, can we you know, actually attain it? Um, well, it obviously depends on the loop dependencies. So you know, if the dependencies are too complicated, you have no freedom to reorder the loops. But let's assume in the best case, they're either none or it's really simple, like matrix multiply. You're just doing reductions. You can do them in any order you want. And then it turns out, and again, we just figured this out in the last week or so, in many cases, all you have to do is take the dual of that linear program, and that tells you the optimal tiling. And, that, the, and the, the dual were those linear programs I showed you in the earlier slides for matrix multiply and for in body and so forth. Just solve that li dual linear program, and it tells you the optimal tiling. And so now we think this is you know, 
applying to you know, very broad sets of code. So ongoing work, um, we're you know, trying to you know, implement all of these decision algorithms. Um, we have yet to find a case where we cannot attain a lower bound. That's still an open mathematical question. We're working on it. Um, quite a few of those perfect scaling results extend. So you can have you know, these n.5d algorithms which scale perfectly and use more energy. And we're collaborating with the compiler community because you know, compilers should be able to do this, right? It shouldn't be you know, every scientific programmer has to do this analysis. The compiler should just look at your loops and do the right thing. OK. So now, as I said in the third hour of my talk, or the last 10 minutes, um, I'll talk about Krilov subspace methods. And uh, so what do I mean by that? I mean, this is well known. I'm going to do k steps of an iterative solver. Each step is going to do a sparse matrix vector multiply. Uh, and that's going to be the expensive part. And so there are many, many flavors of these methods. So my goal is to minimize communication. And I'm going to assume, to keep it simple, is my matrix is well partitioned. So think of meshes. And so in the serial case, what do I need to do? I'm going to take k iterations of my, sparse, of my Krilov method. Each iteration is going to do a matrix vector multiply. If the matrix is too big to fit in cache, that means I have to bring it from slow memory to fast memory k times. And that's where all the cost is. The new algorithm I'm going to tell you moves the data once. It takes k steps of conjugate gradient or GM res or Lanchos, whatever, and it still uh, it only moves the data once. And that's optimal. One is a lower bound. In the parallel case, uh, imagine I have my matrix spread over p processors. Every time I do a sparse matrix vector multiply, I need to exchange messages with my neighbors and do a reduction, right, to do a dot product or something. So that means I'm going to be doing k times log p messages. Log p is the cost of one dot product, and I'm doing k of them. And so and that's going to be the cost. My, the new algorithm is going to do one reduction to do k steps of the algorithm. So the new uh, cost is going to be order log p messages, and that's also optimal. You've got to do at least one reduction. And as we'll see, there's lots of speed up possible, both modeled and measured. And there's still lots of ongoing work. So let me just show you the idea. And since uh, tridiagonals have been used as a running example in all the talks so far, I'll stick with that. And so I want to show you how to take k steps of, of matrix vector multiply. I want to compute this basis of the Krilov subspace, right? Because all of these algorithms have the property that they, they compute some basis of this space and find the best solution in that linear combination. So I want to show you how to do it when A is a 32 by 32 tridiagonal, because I can show you every last detail. And so here, all, all these dots are the 32 entries of x. They're the 32 entries of ax, a squared x, and a cubed x. So the question is, how much data has to move to compute all these three rows, given that as input? So here are the dependencies. Since it's tridiagonal, to compute that entry of ax, the third entry, I need three entries of x, because it's a tridiagonal matrix, x2, x3, and x4. And just to keep the picture drawing a little bit easier, I'm just going to draw that as a triangle. So the guy at the top of the triangle depends on all the three at the base. And of course, this picture repeats everywhere. So to compute that entry of a cubed x, I need those three entries of a squared x. And in turn, I just keep drawing the triangles down. They eventually depend on everybody at the base of that triangle. And if I want to compute everybody, all those entries of a cubed, they eventually depend on all those entries of a. OK, so that's just the picture of the dependency graph. So now, that's all we need to know to say what the optimal sequential algorithm is for this. What I want to do is compute all of these three vectors and touch the data once. And let me assume I can fit one quarter of the data into cache at a time, just to keep the picture easy. So in the first step of the sequential algorithm, I'm going to read in the first quarter of the entries of x, the first quarter of the entries of a, and then I have all the data I need to compute that blue trapezoid. The next thing I do is I read in the next quarter of the entries of x and a, I save the guys along the border, because I'll need them. And then I have all the data I need to compute the red parallelogram. right? And again, I'm only accessing the data once, but I need to compute him. I need to have saved those two blue guys, so just a little bit along the border. Then I do the green parallelogram. And then I do the yellow trapezoid. And I've computed everybody once. Okay, So that's a simple picture. So what, what's the parallel algorithm? So let's suppose I have four processors, and I want Processor 2 will be responsible for one quarter of the data, so everybody inside that rectangle. And because of the dependencies, he depends on everybody you know, at the base of that trapezoid. So what does a classical algorithm do? It's going to send three messages. Processor 1 will send that guy to him. And there's another message from processor 3 to there. But then there's another message and another message. So there's going to be a message at every layer to get the ghost zones. And so what is, how do I, but I don't want to send three messages. I want to send one message. One's the lower bound. So all I'm going to do is bundle up those three guys in one message and send them. And then processor two has everything he needs to compute everything there. And of course, 
this tri these triangles near the border will be computed redundantly. But flops are cheap. That's you know what we've heard. So we're, I'm perfectly happy to do that work redundantly. And so here's the global picture. Each processor is going to compute a trapezoid, and the triangles are redundant. So I've drawn this picture for a tridiagonal matrix because the pictures are pretty, but it works for arbitrary general sparse matrices. So here's the picture. So I've drawn here as a graph a picture of my sparse matrix. So every vertex represents a, you know, a, a row or a column. Now, let's assume it's symmetric. And every edge represents a non-zero in the matrix. And, so, and these yellow lines represent the partition that I've made of my matrix. So that corresponds to the first quarter and the second quarter and the third quarter of my tridiagonal. So let's suppose this processor is responsible for these rows corresponding to the gray guys. What does he need to compute AX? He needs you go one edge out and get the red ones. What's he need to compute the, uh, A squared? He goes out two edges and gets the red and the green. And to compute A cubed, he needs to go out three edges. You know, just do breadth first search, three steps, and you get the blue edges. And so this, all the picture applies that I had before. So that simple block row partitioning I had for the triadagonal turns into a graph partitioning problem. You know, minimize the you know, partition size, or a hypergraph is actually a little bit better. And processing from left to right or top to bottom through my triagonal, I, I mean, I still have to decide what order do I do these things. That turns into a traveling salesman problem on, on a small one. So we can do that one too. So that's going to be my, my building block. And so the question is, what, how do I use that to actually build a Krilov subspace method? Right? I, I'm, I need to actually uh, solve a problem. And so let me show you standard GM res here, and then I'll tell you how to make it communication avoiding in the next column. So standard GM res says, I'm going to take k steps. I'll do a sparse matrix vector multiplier. I'll run modified Gram-Schmidt to make this vector orthogonal to all the previous ones. Then I'll update this little you know, k by k matrix of, of dot products. And then when I'm finally done, I'll solve a little k by k least squares problem with that h matrix, h for Hessenberg. So what's the new version look like? I'm going to compute this. That's a different basis for the same Krilov subspace using that algorithm I just told you. I still need to make it an orthogonal basis, so I'm going to, I'll call the tall skinny QL, QR algorithm that I told you about before in the first half of the talk. I can still rebuild that same little k by k h matrix from R, and I solve the same little least squares problem. So how much have I saved? In a sequential case, the number of words moved between fast and slow memory has gone down by a factor of k. In the parallel case, the messages have gone down by a factor of k. But there's a terrible bug in this program. Everything I've told you is true in exact arithmetic, but there's a terrible numerical bug. Does anybody see what it is? Uh, it's not stable. You will end up with a vector with lattice. Right. What am I running here? I'm running the power method, right? This is a terrible basis for the Krilov subspace. All these vectors are getting closer and closer to the eigenvector for the dominant eigenvalue. And you know, they're not going to be a very good basis. But let me run the experiment anyway and see what happens. So, so here is an experiment on a, on a diagonal matrix. And the horizontal axis is the number of iterations. Vertical axis is the log of the residual. Um, this black line is uh, standard uh, GM res. And the blue line up here is the algorithm I just told you about with what I'll call the monomial basis. And it doesn't show any signs of convergence at all. So it's really a terrible idea. And I'm going to call this the monomial basis because I'm computing a, a squared, a cubed. Those are monomials in the polynomial a. But there are a lot of polynomials in the world. I don't have to pick a, a squared, a cubed. I can pick a different basis. And if I pick a good polynomial basis, like this green one, it converges perfectly nicely. And there's a lot of theory that's been developed for different reasons over time in the literature. How do I pick these polynomials to make this basis as well conditioned as possible? So let me just show you some old speed up numbers and then some new ones. So um, this is running this algorithm on an, the speed ups in an eight core Intel Cloverton for lots of different sparse matrices from some test set. There are two um, vertical bars, the new algorithm and the old algorithm. The new algorithm is always normalized to time one. So the height of the second one tells you how much slower the old algorithm is. And so we get speed ups of like 2.3, 2.1, 1.7, 4.3. 4 and it's color coded by where the time went. So because there's both the dense and the sparse linear algebra, and either one may have been important. And so for example, in this case, the Blue is the old-fashioned sparse matrix vector multiply, op optimized as well as we could, but one sparse matrix vector multiply at a time. And that blue stuff shrank down to the red stuff. That's how much faster that matrix powers kernel went. And then the dense linear algebra shrank from modified the purple stuff, modified Gram-Schmidt, down to the yellow plus the orange. So we, both of them were improved. 
Now, when we first did this experiment, I had one student team student tuning the sparse linear algebra kernel, the other student tuning the dense linear algebra kernel. They made them run really fast, they put them together, and it was a disaster. It slowed down dramatically. And that's because the two independently tuned kernels were fighting one another over the cache. And then what we realized is we had to co-tune them. We couldn't tune these two libraries independently. We had to tune them so they knew they were sharing resources, and then we got these speedups. And so that means that you can no longer just have, you know, grab somebody's tuned dense linear algebra library and somebody's tuned sparse linear algebra library, put them together and hope for the best. It doesn't work. Alas. What does it look like for BICG stab? GM Reser is pretty simple. Here's what BICG stab looks like, the classical algorithm. Here's what the reorganized one looks like, so that it avoids communication. So it, it requires some algebra, but it works. Um, so all of these matrix vector multiplies turned into three calls to that kernel I was telling you about. And all of these dot products turn into one sort of tall, skinny matrix, matrix multiply that went very fast. So how well did this converge? So he, the black line is naive uh, by CG stab. The blue line is the monomial basis. We expected badness from that, and it delivered. And the other two lines are using these other polynomial bases called Newton and Chebyshev, because that's where the, how you pick the polynomials. And they're all doing very well, but they eventually give up. They don't converge. And the reason is that these algorithms, to go fast, they have one uh, uh, iteration that updates the solution, another up iteration that updates the residual, and they're not coupled to one another. So the residual could say, I'm getting smaller, but it could be lying to you, because the real solution is being updated by an independent iteration. And so that's why it gives up and, and stops converging. So it turns out that there's a classical technique called residual replacement that was done in the classical case. Every once in a while, you sort of keep track of how, with, at low cost, how much these two iterations are diverging, and you, you know, resync them once in a while. And then it converges just fine. And, and the number of syncs uh, you know, is like one or two. So it, it's very cheap. And so let me just finish by saying we've put this into some fast math code. Uh, in uh, both on the mini GMG benchmark uh, and also in some box lab applications. And so this is for, uh, uh, for a multigrid application. So why do I care about BICG and multigrid? It's because it's the bottom solve. And the bottom solve is actually a significant bottleneck in, in getting a multigrid to scale. And so it turns out that by making the bottom solver go 4.2 times faster, that's how much faster the BICG stab solver went, the overall multigrid solver went two and a half times faster. And we also got for some low Mach number comb combustion codes and gas dynamics similar kinds of speed ups. You know, the, the very good speed ups in the bottom solve and it was good enough to make the overall multigrid go faster. So uh, we have to summarize, we have new lower bounds, optimal algorithms, big speed ups in theory and practice. There's lots of uh, work being done. There's more algorithms to reorganize. Uh, we need to be able to choose these polynomial bases a little bit. Right now it's an art. It needs to be more of a science. Uh, we're working on preconditioners. I've shown you unpreconditioned methods. Mike Carew recently is, is going to be publishing a paper in SC14 where he figured out a, a cute way to do preconditioning for these things. So that's work in progress. And we, uh, as I said, we need to you know, accommodate different kinds of sparse matrices. So we have a 155-page survey that you can see on our web page along with all the papers. And we teach a, uh, a live, if you haven't had enough courseware already, my one-semester parallel uh, computing course is broadcast live by the National Science Foundation, anybody in the world, in every spring semester. And they, you get free supercomputer accounts to do all the homework. And there's free auto grading and all of that. So this is joint work with a lot of people. I'm trying to give you know, the view from a, a big community. And so these are people locally in the Berkeley group. Uh, you know, my close collaborator yesterday you know, spoke here already. And former students and people at many other places. And of course, thanks to DOE, NSF, and all those important people I have to thank. And so the, really the last slide, it's time to redesign everything. Linear algebra, in-body algorithms, software, compilers. And the thing they all have in common is don't communicate. We have time for, for one or two short questions uh, since we've already into our break time. Uh, yes. Uh, so you have a code available for us to use? Uh, of, which, of which of the many algorithms? Uh, for example, LU factorization. Yes. So, so as I said, we also have funding from NSF to update LAPAC and Scalapac. Uh, that's work in progress. But we have some uh, you know, research codes that are available. And you should send me an email. I remember when I first learned in algebra, I was taught that although the Strassen-like method has better like complexity to, to n to the power of 2.7 or maybe in the future n to the power 
two plus epsilon. Right. It's never used in practice because the constant factor in front of the power. Well, actually, the reason it's not used in practice is the uh, wording of the Limpact benchmark. The Limpact benchmark forbids Strassen. And, and uh, because otherwise, how would they compare you know, the speed of different machines? And so no manufacturer spends any time optimizing Strassen because it's not worth it to them because everybody's competing in the Limpact benchmark. So I don't see any reason not to use Strassen. <laughs> so, so, there is a, so the other objection people have had in the past is stability. And, and uh, it has um, slightly weaker stability. So if you care about the last digit, uh, getting you know, to, as accurately as, as classical matrix multiplied the last digit, it won't. But it's still, you know, numerically stable in the usual kind of, you know, big O sense. The individual might close the lame hex, but then it will switch to the straws and like that. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, it's, a, it's a responsibility of the MKLs of the world to, you know, have the fastest matrix multiply. That's the division of labor. And, of course, you know, and we all contribute to the research to say what's the best way to do that. But, you know, we're not, um, and we will produce the uh, research codes that, you, that uh, you saw illustrated here, and we'll put them into scale pack and so forth. But eventually there's all this machine-specific tuning that has to be done to get the last few flops out, and, and, and that's something that uh, auto-tuning will get you close to, but never as well as the you know, Intel's you know, team of great programmers in, in Novosibirsk, for example. So. so we have one quick question from Barry in the back, and then we'll take our break. And follow in your up. final slide here, you said this calls for a redesign of all algorithms and software and compilers. Does what you're I'm exaggerating, perhaps. So. <laughs> but does your approach also indicate a redesign of programming models, and in fact, maybe a particular programming model that's inspired by um, the whole concept? So, so one of the collaborations with the compiler community is that what they need to do um, is extract our abstraction out from code. Right. So, so this is the abstraction that we use in order to generate you know, the optimal algorithm. And if the user has written some mess, then there's a bunch of compiler analysis that has to go into extracting that you know, fairly simple information, but from the messy stuff the user has written. So what I'm proposing is there possibly an API or a DSL where one could indicate this structure. Oh, yeah. I, I think without the big mess. Right. I, I think that would be a natural thing to do, and, and this sort of says what the interface should be. I, I think it's, it, it wouldn't change very much. <laughs>